Well, good evening. evening. Wasn't that a sweet time of worship? You know what I love is I love watching young people come to the altar and worship. Maybe you know there's nothing greater than that, than a young person who surrenders their heart to Jesus and just comes to a place. I love what God's doing in our, in our young people and break line and front line and in our kids ministry because I just believe with all my heart that, that it's so important for us to be a church that doesn't just babysit our kids. But there's, there's an impartation that's happening with our children. And I'm believing with all my heart that that generation is going to raise up and they're going to put us to shame in all honesty. And I'm okay with that, other than we need to step up our game a little bit, right? <laughs> Amen? Well, uh, I just want to thank you for coming out. I'm excited. I'm excited that they put the Grizz game on a Friday night instead of a Saturday night. Everybody said amen. Uh, and I'm excited that they trounced them yesterday. Can I get another amen? Um, I wanted to mention to you, uh, Christmas Eve is going to come up very quickly, and we have these amazing cards that were printed to us, are printed for us by Alpha Graphics, and they are great. And so uh, we have lots of these, and we would love for you to take them and just be inviting people as you think about it. It's one of those opportunities that you have throughout the year where you can invite somebody to church, and they will most likely come. And so we just want to encourage you to, to make sure and do that uh, as you think about it. I did tell you last weekend that um, as I was wearing my sparkly shoes last week, I I put forth the challenge that as we were trying to raise money to redo the stage, to get things ready so that our our online campuses can have better than what we're sending them right now, um, I did tell you that if we could raise, we had $10,000 already raised towards the 60, that if we raised the other 50, that I would wear a sparkly suit. Um... And I've had many of you say they're, you're really excited about that. So all I can say to you is put your money where your mouth is. Um, however, uh, we've already, we haven't even taken the offering yet. And another $8,000 came in this week towards that. So buckle up Jason, right? And buckle up all of you who have to look at me in a sparkly suit. Because I don't, be careful what you wish for, Right? Uh, anyhow, we're, we're starting a new series this weekend and we're just super excited about this season because it's always so great to be able to walk in to uh, the Christmas season and, and again, just be reminded of, of God's great love for us. So John chapter one, verse one says this, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him And nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Let's skip down a little bit to verse 10. He came into the very world that he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting in human passion or plan, but the birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son, let's pray. God, in the next few moments, as we spend time in your word, I pray, Father, that you will show us what we need to see. God, I know that this message can go in all different directions. It can be heard from all different places in in people's faith journey. So God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to do his job and to step in and to help us to hear what it is we need. God, I pray against distractions right now that, Father God, we will focus in on your word God, I pray for those who are in Star Valley right now and that are watching this. I pray, Father, that you would, you would speak to them, that you would, you would do amazing things as you've already been doing and in Malawi. And God, those who are watching in Alaska and at the jail and, and even in the prison, God, we're so grateful because you are so good and you are so faithful and your word is so powerful. So God, we just, we just rest this time in your hands and we ask God for you to have your way in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So, at a time where the, the Bible is under more scrutiny probably than any other time, and we're leading into this Christmas season, I want to spend the next few weekends and I want to look at something that I think is very important for us as believers to not only understand, but to, to really let it penetrate into our faith journey because it is so important. I, I, I've told you this over the last few years as we've watched as, as different churches and, and even Christian leaders have kind of taken a step back from the Old Testament. And they've said, you know, it's not, it's not super helpful for those who are new believers, it's not helpful for those who are unbelievers because some of these stories in here are intense and they don't make a lot of sense. And so let's just step away and let's talk just Jesus and let's just talk about grace and love. And so, so it's become very popular to do so. But the reality is what I want you to understand over these next few weeks is the word, God's word, in other words, while this, when that was being written, it was the Old Testament, said became flesh. So the stories of the Old Testament that pointed to Jesus became reality and Jesus leaves his heavenly kingdom and he comes to this earth and all the while those stories, those books, the Old Testament, those things were already foreshadowing and pointing to Jesus. So it's important for us to understand there are so many different examples that we can look at throughout this series. There's even at the very beginning when God clothes Adam and Eve with animal skins and he covers their nakedness, it's a foreshadowing of the death of animals that will come later in the Old Testament of the sacrificial system that will be a temporary covering of sin, but the, the permanent covering of sin comes through the death of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And then we see Joseph and he's foreshadowing Christ because he's unjustly persecuted, but God raises him up to a position of great honor. And God uses the evil plans against Joseph to save the nation of Israel, just as God transforms the evil plans of the enemy against Jesus to be the very blessing that sets his people free. It's amazing as you dig in to God's word, you can see it time and time again. And, and as I was spending some time looking at it, there's Abraham who obeys God's command and takes his son Isaac to Mount Moriah and, and then he offers him as a sacrifice. It's an, again, another foreshadowing of Jesus' crucifixion. It's an amazing, amazing thing, but I want us to spend a little bit of time looking at Moses' story because there's many times in Moses' story that we can see this foreshadowing taking place. The gospel of Jesus Christ is clearly and repeatedly foreshadowing throughout the, the story of Moses. And it begins with God making a promise to the elect people as, as his own, to elect a people as his own. And his people are then taken into slavery and they are ruled by godless and cruel Lord. And I believe that that's a foreshadowing of, of what Satan and sin do in our lives. So unable to save themselves, God himself intervenes to redeem them from slavery and to deliver them into the freedom. And that's the foreshadowing of Jesus' death and resurrection. Then we see, as we continue in the story, there's a resistance that takes place. They're resisting God continually, attempting to lead people by their own desires, and the people begin to grumble and complain. And I believe that this is us as we wrestle with the flesh. Many times we spend so much time trying to wrestle with, with trying to follow God, but yet still have as much of the world as we possibly can. But God in his faithfulness persists and he continues to lead his people and provide for their needs out of his love. And he leads them on this journey to a, a, the promised land, which for us is going to be heaven one day. So there's all of these different things that we can glean from this story. But I want to take a moment and I want to look at one very specific story. We find it in Exodus chapter 6. And it says this. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. And we continue to read in that 
says, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. So as we look at this, there are so many parallels between the children of Israel, including, as I was thinking about this this week, and I'd never really paid attention to that before, but, but the children of Israel are in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness, also being tempted, right? So we see it throughout the story, and, and John chapter 39 and 40, says, or 5, uh, 39 says this, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that, that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So Jesus in this moment is saying to the, to the religious folks of the day, he's saying, listen, you guys are script searching the scriptures, but what you need to understand is those scriptures, what scriptures? The Old Testament, right? They point to me, right? So when people eliminate the Old Testament, they are eliminating Jesus, you can't have them because the amazing thing about scripture, the more you dive into it, the more you see the old points to the new and then the new points back to the old. Why? Because it's important for us to understand the relevance of both. So now this is the story I want you to hear today. It's in Numbers chapter 21. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Har, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around to the, to the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? They complained. There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible man. So let's stop here for a moment, because there's a couple things about this that we need to understand. God is bringing them out of slavery, and, and in this journey that was made longer than it should have been, but in this journey, God has always provided for his children. So he provides manna, but listen to what they say. There is nothing to eat here. How many of you, your, your children, you know where I'm going with this. You know they can go into the pantry that's full of food, right? We don't have anything to eat, right? It's kind of what they're doing here. A little whiny, little... And, and so God has been providing every day at, at, at morning, noon, and night. He's got food for them, and it's fresh, now, it may not be what they're wanting to eat, but he was making sure that their needs were met. Verse six, so the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and many were bitten and died. Then people came to Moses and cried out, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Now, it's a pretty harsh story, Right? They're complaining, they're upset, and so God gets frustrated with them, so he sends some snakes among the people, and it says that they began to bite the people, and the people died. Now, I don't remember that story in Sunday school. I don't remember it being that one of the ones that they told us when I was a little kid, probably for a reason, um, but I think there's something that's important to this. So as we look at this story, we need to understand that, first of all, the Lord sent those snakes. People were speaking against God and sinning and he sent poisonous snakes uh, and the people got bit and then they panicked and they repented, right? Verse eight, then the Lord tell, told him, make a replica of the poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who were bitten will uh, live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole then anyone who was bitten by the snake could look at the bronze snake and they would be healed. Now that is a very random story. <laughs> the children of Israel are whining. They're complaining. Why? Because they want to do things their way. They've got this thing in them that I think you and I have in us too. This, this desire to do things the way we want to do them. This innate flesh that we're always having to wrestle with. Because we can go, hey, I read the book, I understand what God wants, but sometimes I think if we were honest about the way we approach it, we'll, even, we'll kind of say to ourselves, well, that's cool, but I've got a better idea. Now, we would never say that out loud because it sounds stupid when you say it, right? But we often will live it 
We'll often just go, yeah, that, that sounds good, but I think I can do it this way instead. And we just start to kind of live things out. And so the children of Israel, God is being very clear with them. This is what I have for you. He's telling them, I have this promised land for you. It's going to be amazing. It's flowing with milk and honey. And every time I say that, I don't fully understand that. Because like, if God's going to have a promised land for me, I don't really care about milk or honey, to be honest with you. I want like palm trees and other stuff, right? But, but to them, that must, of course, when you're eating manna or every meal, maybe milk and honey is what you need to hear. But he has this promise and he says, if you'll do what I'm saying, I've got this amazing place for you. But what happens is they begin to do what we begin to do, which is we begin to grumble and complain and decide that we're gonna do things our own way. And so when that happens, God says, you know what? I'm gonna mix things up a little bit. So he sends some snakes, and the children of Israel begin to realize, uh-oh, this isn't good. We've ticked God off now. And so they go to Moses and they say, Moses, we've blown it. We've talked bad about God and we've talked bad about you. So will you pray and will you do something for us? And so, so Moses begins to pray and God says, listen, I have a plan, but here's the plan. You're gonna make a snake and you're gonna put it on a stick and you're gonna hold it up and everybody who looks at that snake will be healed. Now, again, it's a story that if you just take it by itself, you're going, that is really weird. That's a weird story. But again, if we look at it through the eyes of all of Scripture, we begin to understand that this is, again, another foreshadowing of the reality that for us in our generation and where we find ourselves today is we have been bit by the poison of sin. And the only way that we can be set free from that, the only way that we can find our healing from sin is to look at him who hung on a cross because he was lifted up. And as he was lifted up, now our eyes go to him. And when our eyes go to him, we find healing from the poison that we would have no control over otherwise. And you may go, I don't know. You know, Jason, those are the kinds of stories where I feel like maybe, maybe they're not true or I struggle with that or whatever. And that's fine. You can think that if you want. But in John chapter 3, verse 13, this is right before the most popular scripture in all of the Bible. Right before it, this is what Jesus has to say. No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Amen. So, the thing that I love about this is the verse that we're looking at over these next few weeks is the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. So scripture came alive when Jesus came. What had been talked about, the stories that had happened prior to that, now they come to life in this physical incarnation of Jesus Christ as he comes to earth. And, and throughout scripture, he points back to them. Why? So that we can't argue that they're not true. He takes that argument out. I don't understand how churches can argue that the Old Testament is irrelevant or not true. I don't understand. I honestly don't. The more that you dig into it, the more you're like, it makes no sense that you would ever say that. Because then what you're doing is you're actually saying Jesus lied. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in that position ever, 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 ever. Right? So today what I want us to look at in this story is we need to understand that there are lost people in our lives today. Last week we spent some time as we talked about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And I want, I want to reiterate that a little bit today because I think for us we're in a season right now where there's so much hopelessness. And we are the light of the world. We are the ones that have hope. We are the ones that can speak truth with love and we can change people's stories. And so as we look at this, what we need to understand is there is an enemy and the enemy will bite. And our friends and our family members and our neighbors who don't know Jesus, they have no hope. So during this Christmas season, we need to understand that it's as much as it's about a baby being born in a manger, it is so much more than that. 
It is this place where the word became flesh and dwelt among us because he was here to fulfill all of scripture. And while like those in the story that we just read were suffering with snake bites in Moses' day, today people are, are suffering with the bite of sin and eventually they will die from it. Yeah. Now, I, as I was thinking about that story, I can't even imagine if you were, just imagine yourself there and, and, and all the, the multitude of people and the snakes have gone through the community and they're biting people and you're watching loved ones and friends that are dying and, and so Moses says, listen, guys, this is how it works. God told me I'm going to put this snake up on this stick. And when you, I do, if you get bit, all you got to do is look. And if you look, you're going to find your healing. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of thinking that if I was in that situation and I knew that to be true, that there's no part of me that would just be like, you know what, I'll just see. I, I'm, everyone will figure it out on their own. It's fine. Your, ne- your neighbor gets bit. And you're like, well, I'll just keep looking up and hopefully he'll, he'll see that and start looking up with me. No, you'd open your mouth, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. You'd speak truth. Hey, I see that you're, you're looking down at your wound or you're, you're, you're looking to, for an answer somewhere, but I'm telling you the answer is up there. Yeah. Look at the stick. Look at what's happening up there. And they may go, well, I don't really understand it. You don't have to understand it. Right. You just got to look. Open your eyes because your healing is here. Yeah. See, like, here's the deal. I could see that if you're in that situation and you go, you go, well, I'd love to tell my neighbor about it, but I don't really fully understand how it works. So I don't want to look stupid, right? So I'm, I'll just keep my mouth shut. Hopefully someone else will tell them, right? And we, let, we go, well, that's dumb. There's no way you would do that. But we do it all the time because we're afraid to open our mouth because if I open my mouth and I don't know all the answers, I don't understand how it works or why it works or all of the theology that I maybe need to know, maybe after I take a few more Bible classes or I've sat in church a little longer or whatever, then maybe I'll open my mouth. No, if your friend got bit by a snake and Moses had told you, you look at this snake and it is taking care of your healed, there's not one of us in the room that would sit and go, well, I don't wanna look stupid to him. We'd open our mouth. So for you, what I want you to understand is that that God loves us so much and this foreshadowing that we see in this scripture is so important for us because Jesus even mentions it. He says, listen, the only hope is that I get lifted up that I hang on that cross because through my death and through my resurrection, there comes hope, there comes opportunity, there comes life. And so Jesus, again, I always say this because it's true. Whenever we talk about anything with scripture, we see that Jesus is always willing to do the hard part. He always does the heavy lifting. So when we sit and we go, I don't don't know. I don't know if I want to share with my friends or what if, what if if they reject me? What if they, what if they, they get upset with me? And I'm thinking Jesus's part was to hang on a cross. And all he's asking you to do is open your mouth. That's a pretty good trade. But yet so many times we pull back. We stay silent. We allow those around us to suffer and to die. And the thing is, is if we actually believe what we're, what we're saying, we'd understand we have hope. I can't imagine living in this world right now without Jesus. I can't even imagine what that must be like. I would, if I'm gonna be real with you right now, I would feel like this is so pointless. This whole thing makes no sense to me if it wasn't for Jesus. Like, it doesn't, it'd be one thing if if day in and day out everything was getting better. Then I'd go, okay, I'm gonna hang on because this is getting better. But it's not getting better. Everything is, is getting harder and more divisive and, and, and strange. I mean, there's weird stuff going on in this world right now. Yeah. And it's, but I have hope and it's not in this world. Yeah, My hope is in a savior. And, and yeah, man, I, I got bit, but I looked up. Yeah. You all got bit and I hope you've looked up because there's hope. 
for us as believers, we got to believe that. We got to understand that because there is a lost and dying world and this is your opportunity over these next few weeks to open your mouth, to invite. But I think for many of you, it's going to be more than an invite. It's going to be an actual in-depth conversation. And for some of you, me saying that, that scares you. But the amazing thing about God is, like I told you last week, he walks right alongside you. When you say, God, I'm going to step into this and I'm going to say something to my friend because I see that they're struggling, they're flailing, life isn't going in the right direction, and I'm going to step into their story and I'm going to say something, but God, I need you. He is faithful. He won't leave you hanging. And when you don't know the answer, say you don't know the answer. It's okay. But it's much better for you to do that than to not open your mouth at all. Charles Spurgeon said, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. That's pretty harsh. But it's also very true because if we really believe the story, if we really believe this to be true, it should do something in us. And we should want everybody to know of this amazing savior that we serve and this incredible love that he has for us. This last week, um, we were in staff meeting and we, we do a thing where we call it wins and losses and we just talk about things that are going on at the church, things that we need to know. This was good, this wasn't good, we need to improve here, all of those kinds of things. And Pastor Angela said, can I share with you a letter that we got Uh, this last week. And it was from a 19-year-old young man who's in Deer Lodge State Prison. He was raised in a Christian home until his father died at the age of 11. And then he started going down a wrong path and he ended up in juvenile detention. He ended up in group homes. He ended up eventually in jail facing 50 years in prison. This is what he said in part of his letter. He said, they have these tablets here that you can watch movies and take courses to learn or, entertain, or watch entertainment. And a couple of days ago, I accidentally stumbled across one of you guys' videos. It was a blessing for me. I really, it really uplifted me and got me emotional. There was a specific song that I particularly loved and it made me cry. I'm reaching out to you guys to let you know that you've impacted at least one hurting soul. I can slowly feel myself changing into the person I've abandoned and forgot about. I've even started praying again and talking to my pastor from campus life. I'm excited to see what God has in store for me in the next step of my life. I also would really like to fully surrender to him. When I'm free, I would love to join your church and to serve God. Please don't stop making those videos. There are so many people who are suffering from the poison of sin. And many of them are, are they're looking down, they're looking at their wounds, they're looking, they're, they're doing this, trying to find something. A good quote on Instagram just to get me through the day. They're looking down in hopes that something will click, something will change. And all the while, the church is quiet. When we know the answer isn't looking down, it's looking up. We gotta open our mouth. We have to speak truth in love. We have to step into people's stories. Because as harsh as it is when, we t- when I tell you that story about the people being bit by snakes, And if if, if we were to be in that scenario and and we all just sat quietly all the while we looked up to get our poison taken care of, we'd be the most disgusting people in the world. If you wouldn't at least open your mouth and say, hey, I saw you got bit. Look up. Look up there. God will heal you if you look at that. So what's stopping us? Our pride? 
again, I'd ask you, what's the worst thing that they could do to you? When I was in high school, there was a young man that sat behind me in my history class. He was a nice kid. You could tell he was pretty screwed up, but he was nice. He was just a good guy. Everybody in the room liked him. Everybody talked to him. And I remember one day in my class sitting there, we had a youth event coming up that weekend and I thought, oh, I should invite him to come to that. This thing inside of me was like, oh, you don't want to be that guy. You know, all the other people in the room will probably hear you and what if and all the stuff. I kept my mouth shut. I didn't invite him. That Friday night, there was a big party at my school. While I was at the youth event, kids in my class went and drank. Josh got into a car accident that night and died. All I had to do was open my mouth. I don't know if he would have come. Maybe he already had that plan and maybe he would have said no. think about that a lot actually because the what if on that end is a lot worse than the what if on the other end your what if right now is what if they don't like that what if they're upset what if they say no that one's easier than the what if I have in my life when it comes to that story I hope you don't ever have to have that what if Maybe you sit in this room today or you're watching online and you'd say, you know, Jason, I'm in a place where I feel like I don't have hope. Maybe you sit in church on a fairly even regular basis or it's your first time here. But you go, man, I don't, I don't know what I'm living for. I don't understand. Life does get harder. It doesn't seem to get any easier. I'm looking for answers, but I'm not finding them today I just would love the opportunity to give you a chance to understand the hope that I have so I'm going to ask everybody in the room if you just close your eyes with me for the next few moments because I believe that there are some in this house right now that if you were honest you'd say you know Jason I don't have that hope I don't I don't know what I believe maybe you you believe that God is real and you're just trying to figure this thing out But all the while you're looking down and you're trying to look at what you can do and how you can accomplish things. But tonight you have this opportunity to say, you know what, I'm done looking at my own abilities and looking at my own stuff, but I'm I'm ready to look to Jesus. Because God sees you, he loves you. So much so that he sent his one and only son to this earth, not just to be born in a manger and to go and walk the earth and heal people and preach. He sent him here to die on a cross so that he could be lifted up so you'd have somewhere to look to that can heal you of this poison called sin. So I wonder how many in the room today, if you'd be honest and just say, Jason, I need to make my relationship right with God tonight. Would you do me a favor if that's you? Would you just lift up your hand and catch my eye? I want to pray with you before we leave this place this evening. Is there anybody like that? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Girl. Is there anyone else tonight that, yeah, okay. take one more moment. Is there anyone else tonight that would just say, Jason, will you remember me in this closing prayer? Okay. I see you back there. Yeah. I see you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. I'm going to wait one more moment. Is there someone else? about this young man in jail. 
just by hearing God's word, by beginning to lean into it, all of a sudden he's feeling his world changing. Talk about a place where there's no hope and all of a sudden you read his letter and there's hope. It's not because of River of Life, it's because of Jesus Christ. Is there anybody else tonight that would just say, I need that hope tonight? Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I see you back there, man. Okay, thank you. Tonight, I wanna just lead you in a prayer. And if you raise your hand, I want you to just mean what you're saying. But I'm asking everybody if you'll just repeat this prayer with me, whether you raised your hand or you didn't. God loves you so much. He has the cure. You're looking to him tonight. That's what you're doing. You're you're saying, I'm looking up for me and what I can accomplish. And now I'm looking to him. It changes things. So let's all pray this prayer together. If If you lifted up your hand and you pray this prayer and you mean it, it changes everything. So let's pray this. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you have plans for me. Tonight, I trust you. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to follow you from this day forward. Help me to be who you want me to be. Help me to do what you need me to do. In Jesus' name. Me for just a moment. If you prayed that prayer, you started this journey with Jesus Christ. There was at least 13 people that raised their hands tonight. Can we give them a round of applause? You were bit with this poison called sin. And tonight, when you prayed that prayer, you looked up. took your sin from you. It's not that you have to walk around with poison and some kind of antibody that will make it so it doesn't kill you. The Bible says he removes it from you. It's gone. That's worth celebrating. Amen? Amen. For many of you, what I want to challenge you with is this. Wherever you are in your journey with Christ, if it's new to you and you're trying to lean in and figure this out, then do that tonight as we just spend a couple more moments in worship. For many of us that we've been in church for a long time, I want to challenge you. Again, two weeks in a row, we're talking about opening our mouths and sharing. Why? Because the time is short. And there are people in your life who absolutely need to hear. You open your mouth and share about Jesus Christ. Amen? God, I'm so grateful tonight because you are so good. Your love for us is outstanding. We can't even wrap our brains around how much you love us. So, Father, tonight as we spend the last few moments in worship, I pray for those of us who are already following you, that, God, tonight you would speak to us, that, God, you would show us the people in our lives that we need to open our mouths. We need to share you with them. God, I thank you for all those who raised their hand tonight and who have made a verbal commitment to follow you. God, I pray that they'll leave this place feeling lighter as sin has been removed. God, we give you all the praise tonight. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. There are prayer teams down here. If you need prayer, we just